You are, um, we are recording, and uh, this is the Town of Fairfield Affordable Housing Committee meeting of Wednesday, November 18th, 2020. Time now is 7.08 p.m. Um, Mark Barnhart, Director of Community Economic Development. Um, we also have on the line uh, Chairman Steve Graswell, Gary Macover, uh, Helene Mirtha, Nancy Lyons, uh, Cindy Samarco and Sheila Dravis uh, Costco. Uh, but I, I don't think I missed anyone. So, Helene Daly. Uh, Helene. Oh, I missed you. <laughs> Sorry, Helene. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Call, call, or use, call on user number three. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. I think, uh, I think well, we're live. So go ahead, Steve. Uh, good. good evening, all, and thanks for joining us. Um, so the first order of business is to uh, consider an act upon the minutes from our October 14th meeting. Um, so we can take a motion to accept and then a, uh, um, a second, and then we can discuss. Um, or if, if nobody has any comments, uh, we could just move for approval. Uh, I myself think they're fine as is. Yeah, I move for approval. I don't have any problem with the minutes. Mm -hmm. I agree. Move. 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 And a second from is that Sheila? Okay. Uh, Thank you. All in favor? Say aye. 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 Good. And uh, Janice is texting me. She said no one can hear her, but she's on. Who is that? Cindy. And Cindy's got to no, unmute herself. Cindy, unmute yourself. And Nancy, unmute yourself. There I you thought go. we were supposed to be muted unless we talked. We were speaking. Well, but if if there's well, just a, such a small group, I think we're probably okay this okay. way. You you probably will be unless uh, <laughs> if there's feedback, I can I can probably as the host mute you or okay. you can do that if some if you have a disturbance. Okay, so Joanna's on. Good. Um, the next order of business is uh, Quincy Street. An update. Uh, and so, Mark, when you're done with your update, I have a little information for you. Okay. Well, we are the proud owners of 350 Quincy Street. Uh, we did close um, right around the 1st of November. Um, we do have a holdover tenant there, um, and they'll be there with their family through into the new year. Uh, we're not particularly in a, in a hurry to, uh, to see her leave until such time as we have, um, a plan for the remainder of the properties, either moving forward with a phased redevelopment or, um, planning to just basically cut our losses and sell the unit with the existing deed restrictions in place. I have had conversations with, uh, with the first elect woman, the town attorney, uh, the CFO, uh, Jared Schmidt and uh, bond council, uh, relative to a uh, short term borrowing, um, financing package, uh, which, you know, I, I think is the, the smart way to go. We've talked about that before, which is basically taking the monies that we initially put out for this property, recapitalizing it as part of a, a note, a uh, short-term uh, borrowing instrument um, that would be um, eventually retired when, when we move forward with redevelopment and sell, sell the units and the sale proceeds would go back to, to pay the principal on the note, uh, which, uh, you know, we can finance those things short-term um, for three to four years and uh, the interest uh, cost, even if it were determined to be taxable versus not taxable uh, or tax exempt, um, are very low for the town. So we're talking probably interest interest cost of two percent or less. And so, you know, I talked to the housing development fund; they can do something similar to that, provide short-term uh, financing, but you know, their our borrowing cost going through a a private lender would be higher. So, um, 
and I, you know, the approval process yep. is local. So Mark, that, did that you? Would the next, that would be the next step. I've had, I've had, I have had other conversations with um, several of the abutting property owners, and I think, and we're now moving to discussions about whether or not, uh, and under what terms they would be willing to sell uh, their property back. Uh, have you reached out to Leviticus Fund or Capital for Change? I haven't reached out to any other uh, letters. We had had some very preliminary conversations with Department of Housing. Um, you know, I, I don't know if it certainly would make it easier if we had other uh, sources of subsidy in this, but it, it may uh, a three for one replacement, for example. Uh, be able to uh, cover its costs without additional stuff. Uh, yeah. But partly, I'm um, trying to get some numbers from from some folks as to what what those costs might be. Um, I was also thinking, rather than the town borrowing, uh, I don't know what Leviticus charges or capital for change, but uh, I can't you know, imagine it's better than the town. So the the problem. No, that I it's have, just quicker. I'm thinking quicker and easier. I don't know if it's quicker because uh, the problem is that I the problem that I have is any kind of borrowing. It's not like we have a redevelopment agency here. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't borrow it. The affordable housing can't borrow it. So I, I would need to go through the same three or four steps yeah. to get to the same point in time. So I might as well just go through the board yeah. of selectmen, board of finance, and RTM, mm -hmm. and um, and and borrow at the lowest possible cost, yep. which is through the town. Yeah, and Carol, did if, I don't know what she borrows. I don't know if she's borrowed any money, you know, but they can float bonds too at the housing authority. She could, yeah, she could. And we, I, I have talked to Carol, because um, mm -hmm. you know, that would be a potential development partner yeah. uh, for us, you know, and she, Certainly indicated that she's willing to help um, in any way that she can. So the advantage, the advantage of Carol, but I still think at the end of the day you have to negotiate a development agreement with your development partner, which still needs to get board of selectmen RTM approval at the very least. So yeah, do it all in one shot. Yeah. Yeah. Um. The rent that the homeowner, the old homeowner is paying, is that going into by chance the housing uh, trust fund? Yep. Yep. Oh, cool. Okay. I'm glad to hear that. Well, I mean, we, so the, you'll hear in a minute, I'll give you a report on the, um, the housing trust fund, but not all the uh, transfers have been made at this point. So some monies are still owed. But there were there were some you know closing adjustments uh, that were made at the time closing and including the security deposit and first month's rent. So those go are netted out against the monies that were charged to the housing trust fund. Okay, um, I told you that I was going to reach out to a couple of folks uh, to see. Uh, so I reached out to Duo Dickinson, the architect, and. Uh, he said he could meet on Wednesday coming up at 1130. Um, okay. Let's see. Oh, I'm sorry, 1 o'clock. Yeah, 1 o'clock um, next Wednesday. Um, I'm going to be out of town, so I can't do that. Um, but if, um, if I'm free, else, I, I can... yeah, if I'm free, I could go. I would like to be there. Let me see if um, I so can pull I... that together. I'll just circulate the email to everybody, yeah. okay? And um, and and you guys can. I don't guys want can a meeting here, so <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't mind. You know, Carrie, Carrie uh, would like to tag along, or somebody from the committee that would be okay. Yeah, so, yeah. I, I think Wednesday Wednesday will be okay. Uh, so I can I can just coordinate with you, Carrie. Okay. Yeah. If I'm if I'm free, which I don't together. know at the moment. And and for those of you who don't know Duo, he's he's a really good architect. He's got a article every week in the Connecticut Post on Sunday. He's got a program on the uh, the radio station at UB. I think once a month or so, 
Um, he does a, a lot of affordable housing stuff. Uh, he does um, a fair amount of pro bono work. And so he's a good person to talk to for creative ideas on the front end because he's very affordable because it's pro bono at the start. So. And he's written a book on small housing and he believes in small homes. Yes. And uh, I spoke on his show about ADUs maybe two months ago. I still don't know if it's been posted or not. Yeah. Wow. Uh, you can ask him on Wednesday. Yeah. Right. So, um, Steve? Good. Yeah. Steve, what's his full name again? Um, was well, actual name, I Duo, think it's George, Duo. but it's Duo, D U O, Duo Dickinson, D e I C K I N S O N, I believe. He's in Madison. And we, we worked with Duo before. Um, he was recognized his name when we, when we secured uh, site plan approval. Uh, for the Washington Park redevelopment, he did the initial site plan application for us. Oh, he did? I didn't know that. Yep. Good. Uh, that was the they development did. done by, housing. yeah, Mutual Housing did that, right? That's the 202 Senior Citizen? Yes. Yep. Okay. Good. Um, so I reached out to two other folks. Um, one one person who I thought could help us with the, some numbers uh, hasn't responded yet, but Liz Torres, uh, who's now on her own as a consultant, said she'd be happy to help. Um, and she also sure. knows Duo, by the way. So uh, maybe I'll leave that up to you, Mark, but maybe she could be invited on Wednesday, too. OK. Um, I'll just cir uh, cir circulate the information. That's all. Thanks. OK. Um, does anybody else have any comments, questions on Quincy? Okay, great. Hearing none. Um, move on to the uh, Affordable Housing Trust Fund. Um, or the, the funds available. We um, about 500,000 today. Yeah, so. Again, not all the, um, yeah, that would probably be about right. Uh, not all the uh, transfers were made um, at closing. Um, so what was what was charged recorded against uh, our balance was 256 and change, but there's still money owed to, um, for example, to repay uh, first time home buyer assistance that was provided to the um, original homeowner. So that would come back in as program income, Sheila knows, under CDBG. So that, that transfer hasn't been made. So it, it will roughly be in that $500,000 range. It, um, we had eight, 821 roughly before the, uh, before the 256 was recorded. Uh, but again, you know, I'll, I'll, hopefully I'll have a final accounting of that by the next meeting. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. Um, okay. Moving on to um, the announcement and application. We've got 500 and some thousand, um, and we should really get to work on it in addition to Quinn Street. Um, Sheila and uh, the task force did a good job of pulling together the announcement. Um, and um, I took another look at it. Um, I sent Sheila notes. First, I'm, I'm sorry for looking at it so, again so late, um, but uh, a couple of the kind of overriding uh, thoughts I had, um, and, and Sheila, you can jump in after I just mentioned these two. One is that the announcement itself, um, the format may have to be just totally different because it's a town announcement. It's not really by the the housing, uh, the affordable housing committee, uh, and so I think we would have to um, use a little different, probably a quote legal format. Uh, and Mark, you can maybe address that too. And then the second is that the form itself, um, maybe we could digitize it. Um, and get it up on a link and then people could 
it would be a fillable form. And the people could just uh, fill it online and, and submit it via email, or if they were old school and wanted to print it out, they could do it that way too. Um, um, so um, with that said, let me just go back to the first. Um, Sheila, I know that you've got some experience with this in, in Milford with um, CBD, C, CDBG stuff that uh, that you do. So, um, and Mark, is, is there a, a format that we have to follow or are we given some creative license or, or what? Well, I, I, I don't think it would be, it would, it would hurt to just run it past a few a few folks like the town attorney for post it up if, if that were the request. I, I don't have an issue with that. Um, so yeah, I think I think we are, I'm always mindful when we put stuff out that it is official um, notification of the town. So that's just something just right. Point. So yeah. So it's of course, Town of Fairfield, the format would be changed. You know, I don't know how official I made it up at top, but Mark can manage that. Um, yeah. You know, as far as whether or not it's an RFP, if it's an RFP, then it gets really formal. Um, I don't think we decided that. Yeah, I don't see the point. That, I don't think know. we wanted to do an RFP, because you know, mm -hmm. that'll go through purchasing, okay. and that'll just tie things right. up. This is right. like a preliminary uh, notice of interest, really. Notice of funding yeah. is what I was thinking, yeah. you know. Notice of funding availability and a yeah. preliminary. Yeah. A NOFA, as they say. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Technically okay. a NOFA. Uh, acronyms, but we wanted to say it out loud so other people understood. Notice of funding yeah. availability. And so that way it could get posted on the website, you know, after review, um, whatever those official channels are. Um, in the paper, um, through our local, but, you know, there's lots of media. You know, we can post it on Patch by ourselves. We can we can get a, a, a mailing list together, uh, send it to builders, you know, send it to people you've already spoke to, Steve. Um, I think I jotted down a bunch of, but anyway, we can, we can go, we can go through that once we're done with the nitty gritty, because I don't I think you had some more points that you uh, you brought yeah, up. Yeah, um, but so let's stay with the, um, I like the idea of, of us, well, first of all, I don't think we can do anything without, quote, town approval. You know, we're, we're just a committee of the town, and so whatever we're going to do, uh, we'd have to work through Mark and get um, somebody's sign-off. Well, yeah, Mark, what does that, what does that look like? What are... And he, you know, it's, I think just it's, to cover ourselves, I'm not sure there is um, a hard and fast rule here, but um, but I don't, I don't think it would hurt to consult with a few other entities just to make sure that we weren't uh, running afoul of something that neither, either one of us is aware of. So um, that's probably probably makes some sense. When we're ready. I mean, I could spend a little bit of time making some minor tweaking of the language for, for Steve's thoughts, but uh, and certainly I can take what you did and create a fillable form. That's not a hard thing. I, I already did that with our uh, business. I was going to say, I don't have, um, I have a, you know, I really have a capability of doing that. The only way I would do it is protected Word document, and that takes a lot of time. No, you don't want to do that. I, I have no. the, uh, the professional Adobe version. Perfect. So I could... No, it's always good to have a fillable form. It's always okay. good. My thought on sort of like the overall thing then, Sheila, would be that we have a the announcement and we have the fillable form, and then we we tell Mark and the town, this is what we have. This is where we, where we want to place it, like in the Connecticut Post. And then these are the people we want to email it to, email blast. Um, and, and not individual names, but just like a developer, a realtor, that kind of stuff so that they understand what it is and where it's going. And that would be my kind of blessing that I would want to get. Um, how does yeah, that no, sound? That, that makes sense. And, and the other point is, is that I always like to send notices to all the offices in Milford when I put out information so that everybody's aware in case 
first of all, if somebody has a family member, they can bring it to their attention. Or if they uh, have somebody stop in or call, then they know who to have, you know, who to direct the call to. So it's always good that everybody knows. So you know, that's just kind of common. But that's up to Mark. You know, I mean, you were on the ground there, Mark. So. Um. Um, you mentioned Liz before. Did, did you share any of this with with somebody like a Liz or another developer that has you know walked walk through the pre app and said, "Hey, you didn't really think about this, or I, this doesn't make any sense to me." Have you have you done any of that? Well, I did talk to. You did. Yeah. I I didn't share. I didn't share it because it's not done yet. But I have spoke to okay. um, the. Um, Deputy Director at BNT, Doris okay. Latoya. Yeah, she's very nice. She's going to send me a list. She's going to send me a list of um, financial information that they're asked for. That was really, I really called her about the application part, the second oh, part okay. where, okay. you know, what what kind of information are we going to ask them for once we do that preliminary, you know, uh, review and acceptance of an, a pre-application. So, Mark, are you suggesting somebody like Operation Hope or or Carol or um, a mutual housing or? <coughs> well, it, <coughs> excuse me. It, it may be more important at the application point. <coughs> I think as Sheila was saying, you know, the pre-app is kind of just give us a sense as to what who you are and what you're proposing, and then when we delve into it a little bit more in depth, assuming it makes some sense to consider it, maybe that's at the point where we want to, you know, have a, a developer kind of walk through it and make sure that, or somebody else walk through yeah. it and make sure that it uh, makes sense. Um, I thought you, though, had, had just asked if if we had shared it with, with somebody like that. Yeah, I did. I wasn't sure if we had or not. So. Oh. oh, okay. But I think, you know, as Sheila points out, maybe it makes more sense to, to do that. Not that we shouldn't continue to work on an application because if, if you put out a notice and somebody responds and you think it's worthwhile, we want to have something ready that we can then immediately get back to them and ask for more details. So we probably should have that second step ready to go. Yeah. I'll be ready. Yeah, it, it's, it's, in the, it's in the works. You know, if you all had already started you know, a, a good um, uh, piece of uh, to draw off of. So I just wanted to, to check with uh, somebody else. But yeah, I definitely would do a review and have it ready when we're ready. Um, and so a couple is, of we could run it by a small builder too, because the ask for somebody who's, who's yeah. kind of housing development, that level mm -hmm. is not always going to look at it from the same perspective of somebody who's a local builder. Absolutely. I have, I have some friends, and if you've got some friends, you know, um, I mean, it wouldn't hurt to put it out just to see. Yeah. Um, so, so Mark, you probably have some, right, from your community development block grant lending. You might know a couple of, um, of the smaller folks. What does that see? Uh, through your work with the Community Development Block Grant uh, Loan Funds, um, you might have some contacts with some smaller builders and owners that we yeah. could approach, you know, that the ones who don't typically read NOFAs, you know, that uh, yeah. right. you have to reach out to. So. And I'm sorry, Sheila, I cut you off as I was talking to Mark. That's okay. That's okay. Yeah, I was just going to say we may not want to circulate it. I don't. It's not a big deal. You know, you have to understand. I'm I'm a federal. <laughs> I look a lot from things from a federal side. Mark will understand this. So, to 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 have too many people who might actually apply for it, look at it, may you know, we've got we can we all know a lot of people. We can pull from our you know other resources too. Well, there is that too. I mean, um, I yeah. think you want to um, make sure that you get quality, mm -hmm. quality leads initially. So you probably want to have a prioritized list. Of, I mean, not that we shouldn't publicly announce it, but um, broadcast it publicly. But then beyond that, you might want to start with the, the most prominent.
promising to do some direct mailings and then work your way down the list or yeah. Um, if you get a bunch of inquiries and you have to weed through all of them to get to the one that you know has some merit, uh, it could be it could be taxing not only for the committee but for staff as well. So I think you want to make sure that you're uh, trying to get to the folks that that are in the best position to to do something. Uh, for following on to that, um, Mark. Uh, I had another comment about um, lending to homeowners that I that could be um, on one end problematic because you don't know the, the level of um, sophistication. And so you might get really tied up with a, a laborious uh, application process. Um, but also, I think you, I, I, you've already got a program, don't I you? I think you should have a separate I think you should have a separate application for homeowners. Yeah, you're going to provide assistance you don't you don't want them applying and providing the same level of detail or information that a developer would uh, uh, so, so what do we have in mind I think we easily take what what sheila did and create a separate application that takes some elements of it but maybe it's a simplified form you know whatever i'm sure we can come up with that the other the other side of that is I was thinking instead of doing that, making a separate application for the financial side. So there's there's both. Mm -hmm. um, just to simplify the first part, you know, um, you can take a look at that mark and see if there's any way to the application to kind of uh, rearrange so that homeowners. I did tweak it since the last time we spoke, so. Um, we might want to look at it again and make sure, because I think it's a little bit easier for now for a homeowner to look at. But financially, so a homeowner would not provide uh, that. The one I saw, the version I saw that um, I think you sent out to Steve and myself. Um, I, I think we, you know, may you may not need to have a pre-application if the purpose is to assist the homeowner with converting a portion of their primary residence to facilitate the creation of an ADU, maybe it's just an application. You don't need to have a pre-application and an application, just an application. Okay. But I do think okay. I do think it's a separate a separate program than you know working with a developer that might be looking to do you know a 15 unit development type thing or looking for some okay. financing associated with that. That's probably a higher level of detail that we need. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Uh, that was another one of my comments that we might we want to have a separate uh, announcement or application depending on the program subtype. And so, um, do we want a separate <clears throat> to the announcement for ADUs and a separate one for new construction and a separate one for substantial rehab or put them all together and just have different applications? You know, well, when they the check the box. The person in me would say it would make more sense to have separate applications because you know, as you're doing this, it's creating, um, you know, more uh, touch points within the community in terms of the things that the Affordable Housing Committee is doing with the Housing Trust Fund. So it's an opportunity to be constantly in in the news with uh, some new program that you're unveiling. So from that standpoint, from a marketing standpoint, it makes sense to have separate announcements. Yeah. Plus, the ADUs may, may not be ready to go. We have a program around that. We might wait until we know what regulations we're working to. Right? Yeah, <laughs> I agree. That will be soon, um, Terry. It will be soon. I feel it. <laughs> um, yeah, well, uh, maybe not totally soon. <laughs> as soon as we'd like. <laughs> yeah. So, in that regard, I you know I wouldn't want to quote wait because you never know when things get finalized at planning and zoning. For ADU, and so if we can announce something in December or January, um, we should do that. We should get it rolling. Well, we could definitely announce it, and it's it, they're really called accessory apartments. That's part of the zoning already, so it certainly would apply to anybody who just wanted to build an accessory apartment or modify one. Oh, um, yeah. <clears throat> the point is that um, none of this will happen without any marketing. And it has to be marking, uh, marketing on several fronts, and I can talk about that a little bit more later. Okay. 
Um, okay, so we could actually do the ADU stuff in December or, de or January, even before it's approved by planning and zoning. Um, but um, Terry, you can. Yeah, it might be and... approved, but it might be not effective yet. In other words, it takes some time from the approval. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Time to work on it. Well, we could use it as a double. We could announce the HTF funds for accessory apartments. And by the way, you know, announce the new, if, if it gets passed, announce the new um, uh, detached ADUs as well. It could yeah. be an Those for that too. Are going to qualify for the affordable housing. It's really two separate types of structures. The affordable housing has to be within the main house connected with the door. There's a different size limitation, a few others. And the freestanding houses are the things that people might build on their own. All right. Um, well, we'll, we'll hold more of that discussion for the next, yeah. for the next ADU week. discussion section. Okay. Um, okay, so um, just a couple of other things. The the language about the the purpose and um, the intent, which was embedded in the announcement. I, I think if we're going to say that, we've got to run it past again the other authorities. Uh, and um, I don't think you would see that kind of language in a legal announcement. You might see it in a NOFA, um, but we should take another look at that. And well, the references. Mark, do you have to I think it's enough to reference the the HTF, you know. Um, I don't. We, you know, I was Valley told. To, yeah. Yeah. Unless Which there's is, something in there, the under expenditures that you want to add to the application that's pre application that's not already there. Well, Mark, let me just ask you: if you want to put something in the paper, anything. Do you have to run it past somebody, a town marketing officer or the town attorney? Uh, no, not really. No? Okay, good. That's good enough. That's good. Thank God. <laughs> um, <Dang yeah>. God. <laughs> so the, the pre-app and the application, I think, is best handled by Mark's staff and not by the Affordable Housing Committee. Um, you know, Mark is already sort of set up for that, although he could probably use a few more bodies. Um, well, what do you mean by handled by? What's your definition of handled by? That it would be submitted to Mark's office. Yep. And so, mm -hmm. uh, and, and Mark's office would do the first bundling. Um, I don't know how you run through them now, Mark, when you get uh, applications or proposals. But I would think um, it'd be the similar fashion. And if he needed some extra bodies, uh, we could we could join in and help three to five every other day or something. Well, I would think what would like any other um, staff to a committee, uh, like planning and zoning staff to the commission, you take the application in. You do a, some level of analysis in terms of its meeting. Uh, providing a summary of it uh, and some analysis of, of the of the application itself based on certain criteria, and then you provide that with the application to the to the committee and have the, the and the committee you know evaluate and make a decision. So I, I think there's I think the staff should be the point of contact because committees and commissions come and go. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so there's some continuity there, but you know the committee is the one that's going to have to eventually evaluate it, make a decision. The question is, you know, how best can staff support the committee in providing at least an initial analysis and uh, evaluation of it? I think that's something we would we would do. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. And so it's up to you, Mark. I mean, I think a subcommittee can help you do an initial review and then, you know, weed things out. Or you could do it and weed things out for us. I mean, it, it's really it it's really what kind of time you have. But um, you know, to your point, the the affordable housing 
uh, committee needs to make the final decision, so they should be aware of the of the fine points of something as well. So and understand it because it's a big deal to to give money out. So you know. So this is what I had envisioned: is that Mark and his team, maybe with some of us, would go through and let's say the first round of applications we had twenty of them, and. Uh, Maybe there'd be a point system, maybe not, but there'd be some way to decide uh, which ones are pretty good, which ones maybe need more work. And then one day or one night, not at a regular affordable housing committee meeting, but we would, we would have another meeting and we would go through the applications. And Mark would say, here are the 20. These six look promising, you know, and then we discuss the six and the others, and we would make a determination which ones to forward on to the uh, selectmen. Um, so that works for you know, me. That works for me. Uh, think, yeah. Yeah. I think okay. This is a rolling process where you're you're gonna. Yeah. I don't know if you get twenty at a time. You might get one this month and three mm -hmm. next month or. Three three months from now, you know, it's it's um it might be initial flurry as people like there's something new, let's try it out. And then after it dissipates a bit and people figure out what it is and what it isn't, then it'll fall into a, some kind of equilibrium where you can manage the pace. That's certainly what we've seen with other other programs. But you know, we don't have a a point system to say this application gets 80 points and this one gets 95 and that one gets 36. Uh, and so uh, yeah. how are we going to... You may, you may want to we'll think about one. that. Because, yeah. because at some point you're going to have to come up with a basis for making... Yeah. You know, why are you making this investment? Yeah. Um, and why not the other one? Because the person not? who doesn't get awarded needs to know why too. Yeah. Right. Um, Good point. And so once we get through a pre-application and decide on what we're looking for and then an application, then you can base your criteria on those things and see if your applicant meets you, you know, your um, what you're looking for based on what you've, you know, your notice of funding availability, you know. But we can't, I can't, we, yeah, there's definitely, I have criteria to review applications. I'm sure you do too, Mark. And, you know, everything's a little, it, it's tweaked to get, you know, to the, to the same, uh, to meet the needs you're looking for, but it's kind of a format structure. Um, yep. So my, my last comment question is that, um, that we might, going back to marketing, um, envision how we want to roll things out over, let's say, the next six months. Did we want to make an announcement in December and then one in February and then one in April and maybe hit a different housing type in each one? <clears throat> Don't know. So, well, to your, to your point, the point that you just made, um, and maybe it would make sense to do a, a softer launch and then work through uh, some uh, work through some of the kinks with uh, with maybe a few uh, folks that might be you know really quality leads that you want to pursue before you you know invite the masses to partake in it. So um, yeah, yeah, I don't see this happening in December. No, no, we're not we're not ready. Not with no, the holiday. It's more likely yeah. it'll be right after the first of the year. Um, yeah. I would think we Start putting it out. Okay. Um, well, so with that said, then we're really looking at an announcement and not a pre-app, or are we looking at an announcement and a pre-app? Uh, yeah, one and the same. I think you, you guys talked about a pre-app. I think you should have a pre-app for developers that are looking to looking for financing to make their project, uh, 
work. The, the pre op would it be part of the announcement, or would there just be a a link to, to the pre op in the announcement? You, you'd say go to www or whatever. Yeah. Yes, there would be a link in the announcement. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay so. Good. So we're looking at like a one or two page announcement. Yeah. 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 So what what usually what I do is, you know, some basis of your actual, let's just say publicized notice, you know, it is also stated in your the uh, forward of your your application or your pre app and and Carrie was nice enough to to put together some information. So I encumbered, you know, I encompassed that with mm -hmm. what I call the announcement because we hadn't determined yet. So, um, but yeah, it would kind of reiterate, you know, for, for somebody who didn't actually see the notice, then they would have the information on a pre-app in case they clicked on the link that they happened upon one day on the website or, you know, who knows where. Um, or somebody Good. sent it to them, so they'd have the backstory, the history, you know, the the purpose, right there right in there. the same pre-app. Okay. Am I echoing? Uh, I don't feedback. know. Who's echoing. There's some I'm feedback. getting. Yeah. I'm getting feedback. Sorry. I'll talk it could be WebEx, you know. Um, yeah, um, I think it's probably this. Um, in order to comply with public meeting, I have I'm conferencing in. Uh, on a different, on the same same line. Um, so it's, okay. uh, it worked fine this afternoon. But <laughs> <laughs> um, thank know. you for doing this, by the way. Yep. Um, so to, to wrap up, then um, we need to finalize then the the announcement. And um, so, Sheila, how do you think? What do you think the best way is in order to to get it? Sort of in final form, so that Mark can get it blessed by whomever needs to bless it. Well, if you want to, I would say then if we're going to create a separate application for homeowners who are interested in ADUs, then that would not come first. Um, I, is there anything I else? That, I think there's enough there that I could probably work with. And okay, I good. Needs to work with. I mean, I think everyone's looked at it enough here at this point. Okay, so you're going to draft something and circulate it to us, yeah. and and that, that's good. I like that. Okay. So when so, you when you go through the pre app, take off the homeowner references. Yeah, I can do that. Yep. Okay. Unless you want me to, I'm I'm happy to do that and send it back to you. No, it's in a Word document. So I think it's yeah. Mm -hmm. So, Steve, yeah. your email had me a little confused. Let me just re -enter, Let me just. Uh, um, when you mentioned individual homeowners, uh, you were not referring to the somebody who might be interested in ADU, right? Correct. Yeah. yeah. And and neither was I. Yeah. So that pre-application has not anything to do with, um, you know, Betty down the road who wants to fix up her house because CDBG can handle that. You yeah. know, the difference between CDBG and HDF is that CDBG is income eligible. You have to be income eligible. So um, that weeds out people, you know, right away. So we're just talking about ADUs for homeowners. And then you have a multifamily or or, or um, multifamily rehabs and new construction, right? And there's probably other types, but yeah, those are three that that popped. Yeah, right. And the pre-application goes into <clears throat> we're not looking to do anything over the nine units because then we get into you know what I mean? We wouldn't accept anything over nine units because that's um, interfering with the inclusionary zoning after that, you know? Well, no, I don't think so. that's necessarily correct. If somebody came okay. in and they wanted to do, let's say, a 30-unit development and they needed some of the upfront funds, 
Okay. Um, engineering or, or a design. Uh, I think okay. we'd want to at least talk to them and see. Um, so Mark, do you have a feel about that? Um, it, it'd be a not-for-profit probably, Sheila. But. How do you feel uh, about soft costs, Mark? Soft costs? Mm. Uh, for just regular development? I think for affordable housing. Yeah, for affordable housing at all? Yeah, I think I think we should be open to it. If that's all they asked to ask for. Would that be something worthwhile going through an approval process? If it's gonna make something that looks good that's acceptable to the community, soft costs are worthwhile. Okay. So I think, have, you... I think ultimately we'd have to look at their overall development pro forma and, yeah, and ask, you know, they're going to have to show us what the what the gap is, what the need is, and and you know then we can make a determination as to where where best to invest our limited resources. Yeah, and and the reason I bring it up is project. yeah, the reason I bring it up is because that's a little tricky to um, look at somebody's. Uh, to pay for the up cut front costs and, and be sure they're going to finish the project. You know, really, that's yeah, a tricky have, thing. I mean, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The first in, those monies are at risk. Yeah. 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 You know, things like studies, you know, uh, that's but required. If you, if you talk to, well, if put this you talk to nonprofit vision. housing developers, that's what, that's what they'll need. They need the. Uh, yeah. For an application. Um, so somebody's trying to speak. I don't know if it's yeah. Nancy or Joanne. Yeah, that, that was me because remember when we initially put it together, we said we would entertain. We didn't know what we were going to get, so we would entertain everything. Yeah. We didn't have to fund everything, but we would look mm -hmm. at it and consider it. Yep. Okay. Just brought it up because that. Oh. If it's if it's funded along with some construction to fill a gap, a gap funding, because it's all gap funding, you know, then that makes more sense to me because then they they you know, then you know they're going to proceed. Um so I just you know to bring it up to mention as a devil's advocate. Well, it's another important point about that, Sheila, is that large multifamily rehab or new construction uses more dollars. And uh, do we get to leverage it, or are they going to take three hundred thousand dollars, and we're going to be left with a hundred thousand for ADUs and other small projects? So I think we'd have to look at it very carefully. Um, but hopefully, they would pay us back if it was a viable project. We would give them some upfront money, and then when they got the final loan to do do the development, it would come back to us. Hopefully. Well, I don't know about that, but that brings up a thought I had was, you know, if you, for somebody who might want to build a starter home, we might want to provide more money. So, you know, um, so I don't think starter homes are off the, are off the, uh, out of question, right? I would love to see it. I just don't know how you do it these days, but I would love it. The, the, some a nice home for three hundred and fifty thousand that a, a school teacher or a young family can move into. Well, that we have a home. great, we have a a great resource in community development block grant in Fairfield. So there's other sources, and it's not the only source, but and there's first time home buyer funds for the buyer themselves. Um, there's funding, you know, we could help cobble it together. Um, yeah, yeah. Okay. I'm not saying it's going to happen. I'm just saying, <laughs> would you be open to, you know, more money than less if it was for first time home buyer or a duplex? Um, okay. Um, we should move on, but let me just see if, if Cindy or Nancy or Joanne or Lean have any comments. Uh, I good. suspect no. that uh, Joanne and um... Discretion or on the public line. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, well, then, good. Um, so, Mark has his assignment, and we can move on to the. Thank you, Steve. 
Wait, did we get to number C under that possible other uses? Did, um, we did not. But that's a good point. We did not. Can we get to that? Uh, right now. Yes, Carrie. Okay. What would you like? I think all of those things are really important. I know Mark was on a presentation today, which I wanted to watch, but I did not get to watch about updating uh, affordable housing plans. And um, yesterday. yesterday, well, I didn't get to watch it yesterday. <laughs> um, oh, and yeah. the, the, issue of, the issue of hiring a consultant to review affordability plans and annual reports, that's come up in various conversations as we've had is like, what are they doing and how do we know and who do they rent it to? We have no idea how all of that is being handled or managed. Land banking of homes and buildable lots, that's certainly a worthwhile to pursue. Direct assistance to nonprofits. And I think all those are really important and none of them at this point, at least number, well, you know, there's enough money to do a lot of that or at least get started with that. And I keep saying, because I believe it's strongly, none of this happens without marketing and um, it's just not going to get off the ground. And at least we've talked about the consultant to update the Hounds affordable housing plan. We've talked about that for months. Nothing's happened with that that I know of. Um, the, you know, we've talked about these issues and nothing's happened. So I'm putting it out there as things that should be considered. Oh, I agree. So. Um, let's deal with C number two. Um, do we really need that? I don't know. Um, right now, planning and zoning gives it to Mark, correct? And and Mark, you're you're the one who has to do it. Um, at some point, there's going to be. The, I review them, ask for uh, additional information, and uh, mm -hmm. when I'm satisfied, I tell planning and zoning that uh, the report meets with our. Uh, we recommend the acceptance and we put it in the file. But how do we know if they then, when they get this plan back, they actually follow it and do it and interview somebody in accordance with the financial guidelines? I mean, like we saw, as you said, 1675 post roads been rented, the quote penthouse apartment, or at least some of them have been rented. How do we know who keeps, who's keeping track of who they're renting it to? Well, as I said, in, in December or January of each year, we get an annual compliance report, which lists all the units in the development and what they were rented to and to whom and for what term. And we determine whether or not they were, uh, that is consistent with the affordability plan that's on file and meeting their obligations. Now, uh, you know, as to the income verification that takes place to determine whether Joe Smith is income eligible. The only way I would be able to do that is, is go audit uh, their records to determine whether or not, you know, there's uh, sufficient information in the file, uh, tax returns, W-2s, bank statements and the like to substantiate the finding that the person was income eligible. I have not done an audit. I don't believe planning and planning is an audit. No, I don't think I don't that. have I don't have actually any authority under the regs to do that audit unless the uh, planning and zoning would deputize me and I'm not asking them to do that. But right. you know, they're they're the ones that are charged with compliance. Right now I'm I'm acting as a consultant to planning and zoning and reviewing the annual report, which at least pr provides uh, some indication that they're meeting their obligations and you know, I will say that you know we have we were asked for guidance not just from the planning and zoning other department staff, but you know, developers and property managers ask us for our opinion mm -hmm. relative to their marketing affirmative marketing plan. And I know there was some conversation about 1675. Well, you know, they reached out, provided a copy of their marketing plan for my review. I made some suggestions they incorporated in it. And then they provided a report when they were finished marketing. So, you know, I, I think that there is a process in place. You know, do, have we gone out and actually inspected their records to determine whether or not the individual is income eligible? No, but we do have a, a, a process in place to actually uh, review uh, the annual compliance reports that they're required. 
which I think yeah. is probably more more than most places do. It, it's true. There, there's it's kind of a hodgepodge. Um, but yeah, I think the question really was, are they marketing and how are they marketing? And and if if you're confident that they're actually putting out um, notices of rentals in where where folks that um, could, you know, who would be income eligible would find it, you know, it can, yeah. so I think that's really the question. Um, yeah, it's on the marketing side. Yeah, and 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 there's a a wide. I think many of them are trying to do the right thing. Um, you know, um, so I I've reviewed se several marketing plans and and several mm -hmm. um, have have provided you know at my request. I've said, well, how did it how did it all work out? Can you give me some documentation as to what you actually did, does it comply with what you said you were going to do? And they've done that. So, um, but it's not, it, there's a wide range of experience and qualifications with property managers for some of these developments, the ones that are you know, bigger and have, you know, large property management yeah. firms, you don't have to worry about them, but these yeah. and, and they're not going to try to do it themselves. <laughs> Yeah, and, yeah. and the, they're less likely to put it on MLS, Steve. You know that's why you're not seeing them. Um, mm -hmm. But it, I think that's where you get your information from, because that costs money, and you have to have that connection as a you know with real. Well, I think most realtors, I mean, most people doing the development, I think have access to MLS. But um, the, the need I see is to, to have somebody audit once in a while. That wouldn't be you, yeah. Mark. It wouldn't be planning zoning, but there'd be a uh, a traveling auditor that would stop by every project once a year and just check some of the files. You know, um, yeah. And I, you just I want to keep them honest. And I, I think I think there may be a point at you know at some point. Right now, it's a fairly manageable workload. Mm -hmm. You know, in terms of the number of developments, the number of compliance reports we have submitted. But I can see sometime in the future where that may uh, require additional resources. So I'm I'm not suggesting that this wouldn't be a appropriate use of housing trust fund or other funds at some point down the road. I, I just don't know if we're right there yet. I do think that if we want to move forward with the affordable housing plan, you know, we had hopes that there might be monies available from DOH to help fund that like they did in the past. And, uh, they've earmarked those to smaller communities that are non entitlement. So, you know, there we can use CDBG for that type of thing. We can certainly secure financial we do. commitment from the trust fund money. Banks or, but we may need the housing trust fund as well. Yeah. So, it's, you know, I have a request for proposals that we used last time that we can dust off, update, and we're ready to go. Well, why don't we do that? Yeah, let's why don't we just we dust it up. And... Because you're going to get submissions. It doesn't mean you have to fund any one of them, but it's better to get them in, and then well, we can I, make I a selection. Think, I don't think you want to have consultants or anyone else respond to a request for proposals with with no intention of or no. No, no, we have the intention of of doing it. Okay. We we talked you about it for ten months. Make an exercise yeah. that will waste of time for everyone, but. But we, we've been talking about it for months. Let's just do it. So oh, it, I, you know, it, if, it, if it costs twenty thousand dollars, that's nothing. Um, you know, if you take half of it from housing trust, and you got ten k from other sources, which I don't think is a heavy lift. Hmm. Um, you know, maybe you have to fund the whole thing out of it, but um, I don't well, know if we've explored. What about CDBG? You might what about, able, we might be able to use CDBG for that, but as you know, we have the limit on admin cost. Admin. Yeah, but, you'd have to look at your cap. Yeah, well, well going, thing, going back there, can you do the RFP? What? Can you do the RFP? Can we just say, fine, we'll do one, do it in December, do it in January. But can we yeah. set a target date? 
Yeah. Why don't I circulate the draft RFP for people to take a look at? Okay, yeah, we let's can, start we there. We vote on in December and put it out after the new year, and away we okay. go. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it doesn't hurt, but it, keep in mind it's not actually required until 2022 June, right? Mm -hmm. So, just in case you all know that, it's um, it's required by the yeah. donors in 214. So that's a while ago at this point. Yeah, well, by the state, it's June 2022. Just so you know, by then you have to have a new one. <laughs> we, everybody does. Milford, I don't know if you know I do what Milford's doing. Nobody's talking about it. The, I it's think like, the point I'm trying to say now, if, you know, let's say some of these ADU didn't put into the regs, this is the time to do it because it serves a double purpose. Um, okay, so Mark, you're going to circulate two yeah. things. We'll have time. Yep. 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 Yeah. Okay. And um, if we had, to, if we had some some uh, consultants to, or some proposals to look at by June, that'd be really great, you know. So it's good to get ahead of it. I think that's all the. Yeah. It's, it's I mean, fun. June is awfully far away. I was hoping was February. <laughs> okay. Um, proposals so by February. Sure. You never get proposals by February. You have to give like 30 to, I mean, you have to give them time to get them together. Uh, Glenn <laughs> could probably do it overnight. Glenn yeah, Schalder, who did the last update. Could probably do Talk it about, overnight. It's not much has changed, really, in terms of the un It's how we can now take advantage of some of the regulation updates, or the change, <laughs> all of that. If you put out an RFP, if you put out an RFP, you actually have to wait for people to put, bring in proposals, and you have to give them a certain yeah. amount of time to do I'm it. Let just have Glenn do it. He's very experienced, and it's really just updating what we have and taking, you know, cognizance of some of these new things. Can you do that, Mark? Can you just say, "Hey, Glenn, can you do it?" Or do you have to put them up? No. no. What? No, you can't. No, you have to go through a process. We, okay. We can't. They're not going to let me okay. hire somebody for twenty thousand dollars on a sole source when you have other folks that can provide proposals on this. You're going to have to go through the process. Uh, okay. But he has a foot in the door because he did the last one. But okay. Yes. Um, fine. He ought to be cheaper anyway because he did the last one. So his proposal ought to come in lower. Uh, all right. So let's move on. To the accessory dwelling units. Okay. Should I just? Could I bring up one other point before we move off? Uh, actually, sure. it, it, I'm sorry, the trust fund. Mark mentioned it last time. Starting small um, applications for such CDUs, and Mark had said, you know, do we want to take every small application like that to the RTM? And you mentioned that maybe it might be you suggested maybe we put together a program that would cover that. I think that's a really great idea. It could also uh -huh. cover some of the smaller, like little expenses, like a you know chipping in for the housing plan, or if we were to get a consultant to do certification and monitoring. You know, would they go for that, Mark? Would the RTM approve some kind of little program where we could just <laughs> you brought it up. <laughs> I don't know, but I, I think it makes it makes a lot more sense uh, having them uh, sanction or approve a program as opposed yeah. to. Uh, and and you don't have to go to the RTM. You, you know, the housing use of the housing trust fund money is only has to go to the board of selectmen. But okay. you still have to. Easy. Yeah. So it makes it a little easier. You're going to have to convince three people, but I do I do think that's the way to go with, uh, especially if you're going to provide. Small grants to homeowners to do ADU conversion, for example. You don't want to take all these individually to the. No, selectmen. that's right. I think we can convince the board of selectmen they don't want to deal with that either. Yeah. Okay. Well, if if we could, if we could, if you could think that over, and um, maybe if there was anything else you need to throw in there that would fall under the same umbrella, um, and uh, I think that's a, I think it's a good idea. 
It'll help everybody. Okay. And, and, you know, at that point, if the ADUs get approved, you know, the zoning rigs get, you know, changed, it'll, it'll make complete sense to them. Uh, so I agree, Sheila, it's a good idea. And we should, um, Mark, is there some format that you would need? Uh, we would recommend it. It would go to the Board of Selectmen, right? And we could do that anytime. We could say we want to set aside 50,000 or, or 75,000 for this program, accessory dwelling units, um, and get their, their approval on that. That's what we're talking about, correct? Yeah. Yeah, and I think they I think you'd want to provide as much detail as you can in terms of the you know the application process, the way in which you'll make a determination as to which projects to fund and to what extent. So you'll have to provide that level of detail, who's eligible to apply. Um, so it's it's not it's I we certainly have put those things together in the past to go to the board of selectmen. But I don't think that's a huge, huge hurdle to clear. We have to give some thought to some of the questions. Okay. Um, and so, who does that? Should one of us, or would you, or how's that? How do we do it? Well, you know, I think what we want to do is prioritize some of this stuff initially. So, uh, yeah. You know, I think it's fairly easy for me to get a, an RFP or RFQ that already exists. Update a little bit, send it out to the committee for an affordable housing plan update. I think it's pretty easy based on the Sheila's work and the committee's work to take her application for a pre app, make a few tweaks, and get that up in January. But I, this, this other program may, may be down the road, which kind of makes sense to me from a timing perspective, too, because mm -hmm. I think it's I think you want to take advantage of whatever reg amendment changes they're going to make ultimately at the planning and zoning. If we're going to do ADU, and there's going to be a marketing brochure that goes out and says, you know, we want people to do these types of things, and here's a resource to help you do it. It should reflect the current regulation. So, yeah, absolutely. If zoning is not like January, then, you know, it kind of makes sense in terms of where we are timing wise. Yeah. That and, may be in March, you know. Yeah. All right. Okay. Well, so let's talk about the affordable. The accessory dwelling units. Terry. Okay, the accessory dwelling units. The town plan and zoning meeting was, uh, you know, I, I was observing and, and Mark was observing and Steve, I'm not sure. Oh, you tried to get in, but you were late. They took it up yeah. early, but I, I took notes and I sent you all an email the next day just about what had happened at that meeting. Basically, I felt it was a pretty favorable discussion in that they didn't really bring up anything they objected to. Um, one of the commissioners, Noonan, you know, he, he wanted to go even further than we had gone. He talked about a slightly larger unit, about allowing rentals of less than 30 days and allowing new homes to be built with uh, APUs included instead of having to have the house assistance for five years. And so they, the commission had some more questions for Jim MLI, which they asked them to get for the next meeting, which is scheduled for December 8th. And I think both my um, impression and Mark's impression is that because of the beach road meeting, which is going to be on the agenda, that will probably be tabled until January. So that's really all I've heard. Obviously, I couldn't contribute to the meeting. I was mostly encouraged by their discussion. Um, I think they really realize times have changed and we do need these units as options for everybody, that it doesn't have to be just for seniors, but that we need a wide variety of options in housing. So that's that's what I have to say about it. We're going, the one thing that did come up that I'm not sure where they will go with was that um, Noonan brought up several uh, thoughts which indicated that he was considering, he was asking why the commission couldn't consider freestanding ADUs and other zones besides res triple A, such as double A. And Matt Wagner, chair of the commission, thought that that might need a new public hearing. I don't know if he's talked further with Jim and Emmeline about that. I happen to agree that it probably what might need a new public hearing, but I haven't heard any more discussion about that. Jim, have you? I mean, uh, Mark, have you? 
Um, no, but I, I agree with your assessment on that um, and, and Chairman Wagner's assessment as well. Probably enough of a change that would require a public hearing. So I, I would rather them not address that, you know, kind of yeah. this is the first take. They can always, the commission can always uh, move to amend their own regulations. Right. In the future, so. um, but, you know, in terms of the timing, uh, yeah, they're they're up against the time limit on 131 Beach Road, as far as I know. So I, I suspect that that will likely take up the bulk of their executive session, if not its entirety, in December. So I, I suspect that we'll be pushed to January for uh, further, further right. discussion, hopefully an action by the commission at that time. Yeah. And the other thing that came up was um, just the discussion of incentives and Jim said to them correctly that that's really out of their purview. The incentives would have to come for, from us in some way or some, some other way, but it's not for them to decide on incentives. They're just writing regulations at this point. But the whole issue of incentives is very important. Um, as I look at it, and as I look at other communities are doing $10,000, which I think you had in an application someplace. I'm not sure if it's still there or not, but that's really not going to be enough to make somebody really say, hey, this is maybe something I should do. We may have to consider a larger number or some other type of assessment, whether it's professional help in some way, something else. So. That's a, another issue that we even, have to discuss. I don't know, other than we had a suggestion initially just for ease of, of doing the math. That we had set a, a number, so I don't. Yeah. You know, it, at one point, I had thrown out ten thousand dollars, but that was simply because we were thinking a ten-year restriction, ten thousand dollars, and a thousand dollars each year. You know, you could do the math easy enough if it's twenty thousand dollars and two thousand dollars comes off each year. But I, I don't think we, we've actually put down a hard number on that. No, we haven't. But if I were a homeowner, what I would be saying to myself, "Is it worth?" You know, a thousand dollars a year for me to tie something up for ten years, and the answer would probably be no. Yeah, Carrie, do you know of any other communities that give money or give financial yes, assistance? Yes, I do. I I was looking up something in the L.A. or San Diego area. I can get some more information on it. They were giving seventy-five thousand well, dollars. What about in <laughs> Connecticut? Any place in Connecticut? Oh, Connecticut? In yeah. Connecticut, I Richfield might be. I'll have to look at that again and see. Well, I mean, so, you know, the thing is, if you, if you started out at 10,000, you had no takers, you could always go up. It's yeah. kind of hard yeah. the other way around. Right. I, I think we have to put a number on it, and 10,000 makes sense, you know, to, to Mark's point. I think that's why it got written in there. The other thing is, the incentive is really that they they gain an income resource or they gain a family member who moves. Yeah. In. I mean, there's yeah. incentive for them to do it just for themselves. So if That's they can't true. afford it, to stress that. then yes. Yeah. So yeah. that that I thought is is plain and clear. The incentive is for the homeowner to do it. And if they it makes it enough, they'll, they'll figure out how to do it, like, you know, a home equity loan. I mean, they can put together money, but there's also, if they're income eligible, we could combine the home housing trust fund with CDBG. Mm -hmm. I mean, so... <laughs> There's ways, but I, I don't think you give away the bank. I mean, no, I don't want to give away the bank. I mean, they're That's, getting a good deal. A, That's a, a good I deal. A, I think there's a bigger issue here, which is why are you providing an incentive and whether that is sufficient in terms of the perceived public benefit than just to leave, leave it alone? Because, um, you know, we have a, a certain number of accessory dwelling units now, and conceivably, if you loosen the regulations, others will follow suit. The reason why you're providing an incentive is to get the benefit of a deed restricted affordable housing unit. And there is some benefit to moving our numbers from 2.53% to 2.54%, for example. Mm -hmm. Not why, but there's a bigger uh, benefit to the town if we're trying to cross the magic threshold for a moratorium. To get those points, but if these units don't count towards moratorium points without a 40 year restriction, and no one is going to, in the right no. mind, restrict no. an AU for 40 years, I'm not sure there's going to be sufficient support on the board of selectmen, for example, 
to provide any kind of monetary incentive to do that if we're just moving the number a little bit on the overall 10%. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's, that's my concern. It, it, it was a great argument if you can get the moratorium points because we're that close to getting a moratorium. So if you get you know, 20 or 30 units, you might cross that, that uh, finish line a little faster. And so I could see the town saying, hey, you know, that's worth putting some money out to do that. But yeah. if we if we can't get the moratorium points, I'm not sure if there'd be as much. Well, wasn't wasn't the uh, town attorney going to look into that or you were going to look yeah, into he that? Is. Or the, he is. I, that's haven't, I, haven't seen his, I haven't seen his opinion yet. OK, <laughs> I, I say we just do what Richfield did and just put it in there and have him have him fight it, you know, fight us on it. But but the other side of the coin is it's affordable housing is affordable housing whether we get points or not and so that's that's what the committee is supposed to be doing mm -hmm. is creating affordable housing. Mm -hmm. that's exactly right, and this is another type of affordable housing. That's right, naturally yeah. occurring affordable housing because it will rent for about twelve hundred, thirteen hundred, fourteen hundred dollars. Don't get me wrong though, I still want a deed restriction because I want to be sure it's affordable. So it's well, affordable. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know uh, if there would be any reason to provide incentive, uh, monetary incentive without a deed restriction. You yeah. You have to have public benefit. Yeah. I just didn't want anybody to misunderstand what I was saying. Yeah. Um, it, it's, it's affordable it, because to them, because it lowers their housing costs as the homeowner. Yes. And those are all good points to make. Yeah. And it's affordable to the tenant usually. It is usually more affordable for the tenant. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so nothing more on the ADUs until January. Right? Yeah. Well, and unless they do make a decision when uh, in December, but I don't really think they will. But surprises. The the next yeah. meeting, call it January. Will it be approved then, or is the vote in February then? That's up to them. Yeah, I, they have a. I think they have some time still to consider it, but I I don't know what would be gained out of pushing it further. But it, it is at their discretion. All right, so it, it's January or February. It would be hopefully approved, and then there's a little bit of lag, thirty days before it takes effect, something like that. Yeah, usually a couple of weeks, yeah. three, four weeks. Yeah. Okay. So March, we're looking. Mark your calendars. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Um, moratorium. Um, Mark, you saw the um, the thing that uh, the Alliance for I forget the name, but they put out a new. Um, yeah, it is. Okay. Yeah, a new I map. Kind of doubled our uh, our requirement. We need to do 4,300 units now or something? Yeah, I don't know, you know, I, I, fair, I uh, yeah. It's called fair, um, what they call fair it? Fair share, fair share. Fair share. I, yeah, I read it over and that is one nonprofit's proposal how every town could have its fair share. This is not at all written in stone or saying we have to do it. They're saying they're looking at all the regions, all the towns, and they're saying That's each the town, yeah. Yeah, it's a good guide, you know, it kind of, it kind of just puts it out there and says, you know, yeah. if, if we break it all up, this is who gets what, you know. Now, if we break it all up, then we should look at all of our housing and say what is currently, quote, affordable to people who make whatever percentage, and a lot of it would already count. That's what we should be able to do. And we should say we have, you have 3,000 3, housing units that are currently affordable to people who make 80 or 60% of, uh, you know, and well, the rest of what we have to build. But the point is, this is just nothing more than a proposal at this point and something to think about. Yep. True, it's true, but there's a housing shortage, Carrie. There, yeah, no, well, nobody, there's a lot of people who don't want to live together. So there's a housing shortage and that's why they bring it. That's why they think that number is that number. Yeah. Yeah. But there's no way we're going to build 4,000 more units here. Well, I, Not I'm yet. I'm telling you, this well, housing forum by, by 
Partnership for Strong Communities has been amazing. Amazing. Yeah, so, I've been to, I have attended some of their events. Yeah. We signed into work today, but then didn't, wasn't able to stay for the whole thing. Um, it will be online. It will be on their website yeah. and I'll try to share it if I can get a hold of it. So okay. I thought it would be interesting to maybe have a meeting um, and listen to that as a group. You know, a couple of those. Oh, no, not desegregate. Um, some of the some of the workshops that were discussed in the uh, partnership for strong communities. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. It's a housing forum that the Connecticut Coalition used to put on. So it's a wide variety of things, and there's a couple that I think is just uh, would be mm -hmm. good to well, talk about. You should send us a recommendation or two. Let us let us look at it and and think okay. about it. Okay. So Mark. The moratorium. How are we doing? Can you and can you share uh, your well, screen? We did have. I, I think I sent out the most recent update report, yeah. and Thanks. we did have a few changes this past <laughs> month. So, a few uh, a few projects <laughs> went into the completed column. Uh, notably, sixteen seventy five post road uh, post road loss um, and. Uh, the uh, trademark to develop Alto Fairfield, uh, both of which received their COs, or in the case of Alto, a temporary CO, and we had uh, deed restrictions uh, recorded um, on, on those units. So um, I pushed them into the completed column, which brings us to 376.75 points. Uh, which leaves a gap of 56 points. And uh, we added one new project. I think Aline had mentioned earlier, uh, we did have a code review for a project, proposed project at 888-898 Oldfield Road, which is a proposed 17-unit uh, set-aside development under 830G. Uh, these are townhome style uh, rental units, two baths, one two bedroom, one and a half bath units, uh, of which under 830G, three would be at 60% AMI, and three would be at 80% AMI, and 11 would be market rate. We have approved, and, and there's a, a number of issues with regard to the development um, application because of its location in a flood zone and the fact that they're in that well end, so it'll be a, a lengthy. Uh, Permit process, but I did add so how did how did you get the plans? Did it go to planning and zoning or wetlands or? It goes, they, they file a preliminary large larger scale development uh, fire yeah. file a preliminary set of uh, plans with planning and zoning for internal code review, of which um, you know typically it involves um, staff from building. Fire marshal, uh, police, traffic, uh, inland wetlands, engineering, uh, health department, sanitation, uh, my office, and planning and zoning. So they uh, and sewer. I'm sorry, water pollution control authority. So uh, in this case, the project was approved to WPCA at their September 23rd meeting. So that typically is the first step, or has been the first step. Uh, for most development applications, so it, I put it on our uh, tracking list so just so we can keep an eye on it. Um, so that's six units affordable then, right? Six units that affordable, yeah. 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 Good. Okay. Um, it's not a it's not a bad looking project. It does have some issues, but um, but it's. Um, you know, for the site, um, it's it's not as uh, uh, grotesque as other other uh, others others we've seen. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And you said we needed about fifty six additional points for the moratorium. Yeah. Yeah. So the issue is for us, you have to wait until they're actually CO'd for you know new construction development projects. So the ones that are in the pipeline, we have under construction the inclusionary zoning project at 333 uh, Anqua, the Knights of Columbus site. But yep. we'll need that plus 
several other projects that are just now beginning to break ground, such mm -hmm. as 78 Uncle Place, for example, and um, a few others like that. Uh, all of these are small, yeah. and they, they all provide points, but unless, um, you know, we need three or four of those to, to get What about um, High Street? Do you know, have any news on High Street? It's still in uh, in litigation, as far as I know. Okay. And my going back to the start, um, yep. we needed 133 points. We've actually right. got today about 250. 375. Yeah. 76. Actually, with CLOs. Yep. Yeah. Okay. 376. Good. I mean that includes uh, that includes all 50 units at Pine Tree, uh, which, as you know, is is going to be a matter of some discussion with Department of Housing. Yeah. Okay. Good. Great. Um, and think... your estimation is we're still about a year away from moratorium. I would think at least at least that. Okay. High Street probably was probably, um, probably denied. Eighteen months. Yeah. What was the conclusion of High Street? Uh, it was it's in litigation because it was denied. Or no, I think it, it was approved, but I think somebody took an appeal on it, or it was a uh... wetlands wetlands issue. I think my recollection is the wetlands still was yeah. on, on appeal. Um, question. This is Nancy. If um, if we have enough units under construction, the moratorium, then how about all these new proposed 30 Gs? Do they just stop? Um, anything that that's why you're seeing. I think some of this we, we've had this focus on moratorium applications and the like, and um, developers are sensitive to that too. So if they have it, if they've already submitted plans, it's, it's not gonna be exempt from a moratorium. Okay. You know, moratorium would stop any new application. And even there, you know, projects like those proposed for 980 High Street are exempt too, because those are governmentally assisted, 40 units or less, you know, so it's um, those are not covered by a moratorium. So it's not a total blanket protection against, you know, predatory. It, it is in some respects, but it, it wouldn't yeah. include, you know, what the housing authority proposes. So when, when do we get to that stage where we, we're, we're not going to see these huge developments in tiny yeah. spaces? We can actually, yeah, we're the town be in actually that has some authority. Where, um, we we may be well on our way to a second moratorium by the time we get our first one. Oh, great! <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's just I mean, if you look at the pipeline, it it's uh it's pretty daunting. It is. Um, there's quite a bit of you know for a for a community that for, and it's not it's not all bad, but you know this town for you know three or four decades averaged maybe 50 net dwelling units per year. And what are we looking at here? Several thousand on the on the sheet there. I mean, it's it's uh, and and some of those are already completed. So I don't mean to make it sound worse than it is, but it it's a it's a sea change in terms of some of the development activity that we've seen. And that's not again to Sheila's point earlier. That's not all bad because we do need more housing units in some of these areas. Um, yeah, it'd be and nice for the town to have some control. Actually, with the neighborhood, so it's not a problem. Yeah. Somebody, somebody commented today that um, that there was a comment today by one of the uh, one of the um, presenters that the zoning boards, mostly in Connecticut, are living in in the past. Basically, that's not a straight direct quote, but planning is not there. They're not they're not with the times. Um, the demographics, anything. So, yeah, it'd be nice to be able to be ahead of it. It'd be nice to be able to do it and control it. But 
you know, that's a zoning issue. Well, but the zoning, zoning? It's, it's the residents. You know, we make up the town, we make up the government. And so we have an input. And, and if we want something, we can make our voices heard. Mm -hmm. If we can identify areas of the town that work for affordable housing, more dense developments, whether they're, it's along some of our existing commercial streets or nearby to some of our commercial streets, that puts us ahead when we say, okay, we will accept this type of, you know, it's like the transit development district where it's okay, it's fine. And we need more of that kind of thinking. And I think this commission may be, I mean, even their reflections about ADUs have indicated they're beginning to see that, that the changes in demographics and housing needs are, are real. So I'm hopeful that we can maybe work on that. I'd like to give them some more suggestions. I mean, you know, to, you all were talking about, well, you know, I'm not a zoning expert but at all, but, you know, you and uh, Mark and Steve were talking about um, Tungsis Hill area and uh, looking at that for rezoning and multifamily, you know, with commercial, makes sense. The transportation corridor, already street improvements. There's a, there's a nice little lot in Greenfield Hill. Um, the Jehovah Witnesses has an acre up there for sale. That'd be a nice spot. That would be That's on a sewer line. That's what yeah. I look at, it's on a sewer line. And and I know a little place that would have been perfect for an ice cream store, absolutely perfect. And I don't know what happened with that. Uh, that the gas cold. station? Yeah. Uh, maybe, okay. maybe we need takeout soup. Maybe they'd go for that. I don't know. But anyway, it was, um, you know, you need commercial, you need residential. These have to be co together in a way. So that would have been good. What's happening with that? Okay. Uh, well, do we know any Mark? Have you heard anything? The Jehovah's Witness, Jehovah's Witness on Greenfield Hill. No, I haven't heard anything. No. Recent. Has uh, has any Helene or? No, I had gotten an email, and I spoke to. Um, I think she was a member of the RTM. I, I was a uh, a broker. Yeah. And she sent me some info. Yeah, no, Veronica. I no, I I haven't heard anything either. Yeah. Um, I think it was Veronica. Yeah. Um, no. But not uh, I had suggested that um, it'd be a nice site for affordable housing, um, but I didn't hear back. Well, you would only do that uh, as an 830G application, unfortunately. It's yeah. not going to Well, it, you don't necessarily have to in an 830G. If you do it right, the, the community would support you. Maybe. You dream on, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're all dreamers, are we not? I think what you know, it would be it would have been perfect for what I'm always talking about, which is pocket neighborhoods, which would be eight or twelve small single family houses on that acre site. Because it, like it that, would have yeah. been perfect. Uh, but mm -hmm. still that the community would still <laughs> tremendously object to it, knowing that community. If you did an eight thirty G that looked like that, I you know, you it might actually happened but i still think you would need the 830g and yet some sensitivity to the neighborhood to be able to have something that could work there's a little place on the upper west side of manhattan called pomander walk which is i don't know maybe 10 little units and they're they're now old maybe 100 years old but they're stuck away you would never know them it's in the middle of the west side and, and everybody really, loves it yeah you know <laughs> Uh, Small is just cute. Need time, time and money. That's all. That's all. Yeah. You know, in in speaking with this is Helene. In speaking with um, different people on this topic, I I really think that there are more people who would be okay with a thirty G if the style and the and the size of these um, developments were were scaled down. For instance, I mean, the, the eight and a half acres that Carol is in contract with uh, up on Mill Hill Terrace, that would be the most wonderful retirement village in there. If they could do, you know, like one level or one and a half level, you know, like with the small second floor uh, units with 
uh, senior living. I, I've, I've talked to all the neighbors up there. They would all be in favor. They are in favor of something like that. What they're not in favor of, and they're afraid that's going to happen is that there will be, you know, five, five story buildings back there. Um, that's what they're afraid of. But I think there are more people who are okay with affordable housing in 830G if it's just done on a scale yeah. that is appropriate to the neighborhood. That's really where the where a lot of people have a problem with this. You know, with, with Beach Road and High Street. Mm -hmm. Take it over. Yeah. Carrie, are you gonna show something or I was gonna try and show Palmander Walk, which I just pulled up oh. on my computer. But I don't think I'm going to do it because it looks like I haven't quite set it up right. But that's yeah. all. Okay. Yeah. Another time. Yep. Um, so uh, that's it for uh, the moratorium and old business. Any new business? Um, anything else? Uh, Thanksgiving plans? Uh, He's got Thanksgiving plans. Yeah. Uh, Zoom dinner. <laughs> yeah. Hey, hey, by the way, I don't know if I should let this out of the bag, but uh, on Thanksgiving, Zoom's going to lift their 40 minute maximum for free. Yeah. Did so you hear that? Yeah. yeah. Oh. Mm -hmm. oh, that's cool. Yeah, that's cool. That's good. Yeah. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Yes. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Don't tell anybody. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, thank you guys. Um, Mark, you'll send out a few things. And. Yep. Uh, and we'll meet we'll again in, in December. Yep. Okay. Thanksgiving. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thanks. Thanks. You Thank too. Thank you, everyone. Bye, Have everybody. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Good night, everyone.